Uh, well, a warm good evening to all the doctors from the medical fraternity. On behalf of Dr. Reddy's, I, Dr. Snehal Muchala, Team Lead Medical, welcome each one of y'all to this online webinar on Molnupiravir, a new dimension in the management of COVID-19. Uh, this webinar is being conducted by IGCP and well supported by Dr. Reddy's. Uh, at the onset, I wish that you and your family are safe and healthy amidst this COVID pandemic. Uh, and uh, this webinar, what we are conducting on Molnupiravir, will be moderated by Dr. Keetan Mehta. And uh, it will, the speaker for the day is Dr. Shashank Joshi, sir. Well, both our moderator and speaker does not require any, uh, I can say, <laughs> any formal introduction. But I would love to do the due honors and I would like to introduce Dr. Keetan Mehta to this August Catherine. Uh, Dr. Ketan Mehta is a practicing physician at Asian Heart Institute, Suchak Hospital, Nama Hospital, and Lifeline Medicare Hospital. Dr. Ketan Mehta has got a large number of affiliations to his credit. To name a few, he is the Honorary General Secretary for ISC 2020-22, Honorary Secretary ISC Con for 2022, Vice President IMA Mumbai West 2021-22, uh, uh, 2019 to uh, 2020. Also a convener for NatCon 2017. Vice President for IMA Maharashtra State 2015-16. Uh, Dr. Dr. Ketan Mehta is also the chairman for the IMA Headquarters Standing Committee for the Antimicrobial Resistance, that is 2021. And also the member for the IMA Headquarters Fever Advisory Board 2020. With this, I would like to welcome Dr. Mehta. Yeah. Thank you, Snail. Uh, very good evening to one and all. And at the onset, I would like to thank IJCP and Dr. Reddy's laboratory for organizing today's webinar and inviting me to moderate the session. Friends, all of us going through this COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm sure all of us are now waiting when this term pandemic will be given up. We have seen the change in our practice, what we were doing, and we have seen the COVID-19 which has taken a swings way in way back from when it started in late 2019. Of course, in India, we saw our first case only in 2020. During the first wave, we have seen there were hardly any weapons and people were using repurposed drugs for different outcomes. And there are drugs which were used within no time. It showed there was no significant benefits in it. The first wave, which has given us a significant impact in terms of a psychological trauma, which was a huge, and it has affected our medical fraternity to a large extent. At that time, we got our first antiviral in the form of Fevipiravir, which was started using it in an oral form. Of course, we were using Remdesivir also, but the dosage and all, which was so cumbersome with the Fevipiravir, people were not comfortable using it. Then came the second wave in early 2021, and that was really shaken up the entire world, including our country. No, we were just waiting that when it will get over, because we were not seeing any good hopes in near future. And that time, in the end of 2021, we started seeing a ray of hope in the form of new baby, which was born, where we got approval by DCGI in December and and today, when the third wave has started, we had that strong weapon and all of us have witnessed using it and benefited. So friends, today to discuss on this new armamentarium that is on Molnupiravir, what is how it is can change or it has changed our practice in fighting the COVID-19. We have a fantastic speaker and it's my proud privilege to introduce my dear friend, Professor Dr. Shashank Joshi. I'm sure Dr. Shashank Joshi does not need any introduction. And you know, if I have to introduce his points, it would be one full session, which can go only on the introduction of Dr. Shashank Joshi. He has been the president of numerous organizations, including Association of Physicians of India, Research Society for Study of Diabetes in India, All India Association of Advancing Research in Obesity, Endocrine Society of India, Indian Academy of Diabetes, so on and so forth. He has been actively involved in various activities of American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and is serving as the chairperson of India. He was honored by Government of India by awarding him Padma Shri in 2014 in recognition of his efforts 
to his contribution in the field of medicine. He is the recipient of various national and international awards by various organizations, had delivered 200 orations at national and international level. He is currently the task force of Maharashtra government for COVID-19. And he is one who is really pioneered in talking to the government health ministry and planning the final decisions about everything. And I, with these words, I invite my dear friend, Dr. Shashank Joshi to give his talk. Over to you, Shashank. Thank you, Ketan. Uh, at the onset, I want to thank <clears throat> my friends from um, IJCP, uh, Pooja, Chitra, <clears throat> Nilesh, everybody. And I also want to thank uh, my friends from Dr. Reddy's Labs, Dr. Snehal, Dr. Mayank, and everyone from there. And of course, uh, Ketan, for a kind words of introduction. Uh, you are very right that uh, we are now seeing the final stages of the third wave. And, uh, you know, everybody is impatient, everybody wants to go back to work, to normalcy. But, you know, we are uh, blessed to have a new tool with us. We have an oral tablet, uh, which can be given early, and it can make a difference. And we saw that difference palpable in the third wave. So, very clearly, we can see that that difference has been crucial and critical. So, we are looking at a very efficient and a very therapeutic strategy, which is an oral tablet, four tablets twice a day, for five days, if given early, can make a difference in COVID management. But before I do that, let me go over some fundamentals of COVID management. So what I want to do is first, where are we on COVID today? What is the trend of COVID treatment today? Because COVID is live document. What may be true today may not be true tomorrow. What is the fact sheet on the real evidence-based facts on molinipiravir? And maybe some frequently asked questions on the use of molinipiravir. So we know that COVID-19 is caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. The original virus was identified in Wuhan. It has spread to almost every country on planet Earth. It had an enormous burden on healthcare because of its transmission dynamics and the polyphasic nature of its illness and the socio-economic impact has been huge. US took the cake with the largest burden of the disease. India won the pecking order of number of cases due to its population was at number two. COVID pandemic in India has been huge. And as we talk on the 25th of February, we see that the burden of disease in India has been high, but we have one, have one of the lowest mortalities on planet Earth. And we have definitely seen a large asymptomatic population. And our active cases also are on the decline. The deaths also have been to the tune of around 2% in India, global trend being around 5%. <clears throat> if you see the new cases versus new recoveries, as we talk today, clearly the second phase of the third wave is on the decline with recoveries more than the new cases. And if you look at the morphology of the case distribution, most cases were mild, 80% and in the Omicron wave around 95%. Severe was around, moderate to severe were 14 cases and critical were 5%. While in the Omicron wave, it was 4% and 1% respectively. We had many as Variants of concern, <clears throat> Alpha from UK, Beta from South Africa, Gamma from Brazil, Delta from India. Omicron started from Botswana and South Africa, but predominantly spread across the world. The typical acute viral prodrome was flu-like. That was the first stage, that is hit hard, hit early. Lymphocytopenia, thrombocytopenia, ICRP, D-dimer. Then came the lung phase with high CRP and then came the cytokine storm, which was rare. Obviously, the asymptomatic people were diagnosed through RT-PCR. And then, of course, we had mild to moderate and viral virus actively multiplied. 
at that stage we had antivirals anti thrombotics steroids immunomodulators plasma came in and went away hyperimmune serum came and went away monoclonal antibodies and so on and so forth the primary reason is that we need to intervene early it had it early we know covid can be mitigated by simple well fitting mask and and appropriate hygienic practices a good distancing with good air ventilation at humidity avoiding crowded spaces getting vaccinated and early and timely preventive measures is the key we know the active virus multiplies very actively a couple of days when it is in incubation when somebody is asymptomatic and actively multiplying and the shedding continues for around 8 to 10 days in omicron it could be shorter and it is in that pre symptomatic stage prevention is the key where sms and v were the key social distancing mask sanitization and vaccination <clears throat> it is in that stage if we can intervene and treat we can actually eliminate the disease and intercept the disease well in the mild cases we can hit hard it early and prevent severe at risk cases to go to progress and that's where there is a role for antivirals in moderate to severe disease we need to give oxygen support anti inflammatory immunomodulants anticoagulants monitoring and so on and so forth so treating early covid is the critical need of the hour with a simple oral tablet without any adverse events which is scalable and therefore the dictum is hit hard hit early so that's really the key and obviously when we want to hit hard hit early with antivirals we want to re reduce the disease progression by targeting the sars cov2 virus reducing the viral load and viral shedding reduce the duration of the disease and transmission and ensure that the duration of viral shedding is reduced so clearly to curtail subsequent waves we want to use antivirals to reduce the size and peak incidence and time to initiate antiviral therapy should be as early as possible as quickly as possible because we know the later we start more is the disease severity so that's really the dictum and the dogma molnupiravir actually started its development when at the university emery in atlanta georgia where there is cdc located and it is funded by the coca cola corporation atlanta is the largest airport on planet earth in 2013 started research on ribonucleoside analogs for eev eev is equine encephalopathy virus spread by mosquitoes which was fatal and these were weapons of the cold war in 2016 emery received the defense threat reduction agency contract to develop measures to counter this eev virus and nih gave it money in 2019 to develop antivirals against influenza in march 2020 the eidd 2801 Ridgeback Biotherapeutics decided to modulate it as a license for antiviral therapy. By April, they had started phase one clinical trials, and then Merck collaborated with them for phase two and phase three clinical trials. And by October 2021, Merck submitted EUA to FDA. UK was the first country to approve molnupiravir, and they have fully opened up because molnupiravir-like agents. allowed them to open up you can fast and december us fda also gave them authorizations uk us fda denmark philippines japan korea and indian dcj all have approved molnupiravir it's a pro drug so clinically pharmaceutically the molnupiravir is cleaved in the intestine and the liver during absorption and its analog which is converted to nhc the nucleoside circulates in the plasma and is taken up by cells and is phosphorylated into the nhc tp active molecule the elimination is via metabolism to uridine and cytidine and there are no expected drug to drug interactions and there is no expected effect on renal and hepatic impairment on the plasma so basically the nhc and the nhc tp 
adopt two tautomeric forms oxymes and hydroxyamylines which behave either like utp or ctp so there are two steps step 1 and step 2 one is incorporation into the sars cov2 rna template strand the nsa can direct incorporation into either the guanosine or adenosine resulting in transition errors c to u u to c g to a a to g and that in turn in the viral rna repair impair viral replication and infectivity so it gets imbibed and incorporated and it introduces errors so it's basically a substrate for the rna polymerase and there is a error catastrophe which is replicated and propagated so clearly this is very very clear that this is a very robust antiviral drug not only on sars cov2 but various other flu like viruses including influenza including equine encephaloviruses so molnupiravir will not only have a role only in covid but it will have a role to all flu like viruses because of the data available it's a very good rna anti rna viral activation and therefore in times to come even against influenza it will be a good drug to use the clinical trials which were done phase 2 was the move out trial this trial was prematurely terminated because the placebo group the data safety monitoring board felt that the data was so overwhelming that they had to prematurely terminate this us fda approved trial because of its compelling positive result people above 18 with mild to moderate covid symptomatic symptom duration less than 7 days were randomized double blind given 200 400 800 mg molnupiravir versus placebo for 5 days stratified by symptom duration and risk status and their end point was hospitalization or death at the one month and of course dose selection of viral load infectivity viral nucleotide substitution was looked at 58 sites were enrolled 12 countries were enrolled including us and a large recruitment program was ensued and clearly you can see the viral load reduction was largest for 800 mg dose of molnupiravir the lowest percentages were seen in people who had molnupiravir in positive cultures and clearly it was a very compelling result which allowed it to go to the phase 3 non hospitalized adults which is now published in new england journal of medicine on december 16th with mild to moderate covid did not progress to severe illness and this was 800 mg of molnupiravir two tablets of 200 mg twice a day for 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 five days versus a placebo primary and secondary endpoints being all cause hospitalization and death and secondary being progression to disease and clearly you can see a three point reduction <coughs> reducing the risk of hospitalization of death by day 29 so statistically significant reduction in mortality was seen and severe disease was seen with molnupiravir and it was across all variants across all age groups zero positive zero negative mild moderate severe age and so on and so forth across all comorbidities including the who 11 point ordinal scale showed a classic response of outcomes with adverse events comparable to placebo except for maybe a marginal diarrhea nausea and dizziness it was very safe very well tolerated drug and we have seen it in the third wave we have used it me and ketan extensively we have not had observed any major adverse event particularly in people about 50 including various comorbidities including renal and hepatic disease we have not seen any challenges with molnupiravir i have used it for population up to 98 years of age in the indian population so molnupiravir has clear data compelling data to reduce hospitalization and deaths it can be used in adult population who are normal by day 3 the viral shedding becomes negative so the disease is not transmissible it is a, has effect against all viruses as we talk just yesterday one paper has been published including omicron a simple 5 days earlier you use the better is the response with hard eater if i get a symptomatic patient with fever above 50 i have blindly given them molnupiravir with good symptomatic relief 
So remember, my classical patient is person above 50 with comorbidities, with symptoms, including fever, and particularly if there's persistent fever. This is a standard of care, and I've hardly seen any post-COVID syndrome. And there's very, very good data, including DRL's own data. You know, DRL partnered with Merck to do its original innovative study for India. And they studied it in A23 subjects. And they clearly showed that adverse events were negligible and the impact was clear cut. And it was a very, very safe drug. So for me, molnipiravir is a standard of care. In people who are at risk to deteriorate, who are above 50 years of age, who are likely to get hospitalized and die, it reduces the viral load and transmissibility and disease severity. And it clearly reduces inflammation, including CRPs, when there's a high baseline CRP. So we clearly saw that this was a wonderful molecule in our armamentarium, which we use very efficiently in the third wave. I wish we had this armamentarium with us when the Delta wave was there, we would have saved many more lives. You know that predominantly the Omicron variant was a nose and a throat COVID. Delta still was around. The Delta is a nose, throat, and a lung COVID. And clearly molecules like molnipiravir, if used appropriately in the right category, if we hit hard, hit early, can be life-saving and has very elegant data published in elegant journals like New England Journal of Medicine, documenting its safety. The concerns related to teratogenicity, mutagenicity are unfounded through the mediums of social media and should not deter us from using the drug in eligible population, particularly if the population is symptomatic, above 50, with comorbidities, with a risk for deterioration. So clearly, this is something which we need to recognize. We have not got hyped by media concerns because they are not evidence-based at all. We have used the drug efficiently during the third wave. We have been getting out of the third wave. And we have clearly seen that people with molnipiravir versus people who did not take molnipiravir, who are symptomatic with the Omicron variant, did not have long-term thrombotic or long-term long COVID symptoms. We are now analyzing the data over three months. Three months of the third wave are still not over. By end of April, we will submit our report to document this fact, which I'm generating because currently this data is anecdotal. Clearly, molnipiravir is a very good, useful antiviral agent in the COVID space, will have also a role in the flu-like viral syndromes including the influenza space and the H1N1 space. And we should have now a good antiviral, which is oral in nature, which will be available and is available to our population as the wave recedes. Remember, there is still active virus in circulation. Below 18, don't use it. Between 18 to 50, clinical discretion is recommended. Above 50, I have no hesitation using it. Between 18 to 50 also, I've used it. And also there are ongoing trials of molnipiravir in exposure profile access, which means if you are exposed to a COVID patient, you can take it for prevention or profile access also. That data is also ongoing. And this year itself, we will have those publications out in public domain. So it's a good molecule, launch timely, and various bodies have recommended it, including the NIH guidelines. Of course, Government of India, ICMR guidelines and various other guidelines have not recommended it for reasons known best to them. But evidence base is clear cut that this drug, if used appropriately, saves lives, reduces hospitalization. Data has been published. The safety is established beyond reasonable doubt. And obviously, the only current limitation for it would be the cost as a rate limiting step. But I'm given to understand that in India, with Dr. Reddy's lab and various other generic manufacturers, they have overcome that in a big way. As Omicron was mild, need for oxygenation was less, and a lot of people did not deteriorate 
because a large population has used the drug. In UK, this drug has been routinely prescribed in the current wave in the months of December and January by general practitioners. And I'm reasonably certain that Indian physicians have also used this drug efficiently in eligible population in the current pandemic. So I guess I'll stop here, Ketan. I'll be more than happy to take any questions which are there. And I'm sure a lot of uh, insights you will have also, Ketan. I'm sure you have used the molecule in the third wave. And I wish that this molecule was with us in the second wave during the sinister Delta variant. And I really wish and pray, though we have good friends in our Dr. Eddie's lab, that we are done with COVID now. And we start living a life with COVID, during COVID, in a post-COVID era. Thank you. Thank you, Sashank. It was a fantastic presentation, as usual, from your end. I, I, friends, I remember Shashank's interest in infectious diseases. I'm recollecting my residency days when Shashank was my senior. And I would say, you know, that time when he was doing endocrinology, and I recollected that time HIV AIDS was so much, like people were like not interested in that subject. And I remember the way the Shashank had given his dedicated interest in HIV and AIDS. And I remember he used to have a separate OPD running for HIV AIDS. I remember those days he started with JJ Hospital. And his, his dedicated interest out of his subject. And today also, I am sure he can beat any of the ID consultant in the country or this thing. What the way he has explained it. So Shashank, I, I admire your interest out of it. And today, the way you have presented, that's really admirable. So we have friends. Yes, the questions are coming. So before we take up those questions, now let me uh, start with that. And let's have clear, as Shashank was rightly saying, it is the social media who, you know, it hyped up certain issues or literally suppresses so many things. And same thing happened when Molnupiravir came, the, they will started projecting all negative impacts of it rather than telling what the positive facts about it. And they just started talking about only the negative, negative and negative points about it and which created a lot of confusion. And I'm sure all of us have faced this issue when, whenever even we want to prescribe the patient, you said, doctor, is this medicine which you're prescribing, it's having a problem, I will have problem in conceiving or will that how am I, if I conceive later on, will my child will have affection uh, or how can I give it? It has been not been recommended, so on and so forth. And as even as Shashank said that, you know, why you are prescribing this drug, which has not been approved by ICMR, so on and so forth. So here we must remember DCGI. DCGI will not give a approval unless it has got have a strong data. And it is the drug which is approved by DCGI. And let me remind you, when we were talking about earlier drugs, even Favipiravir today has not got approval in the Western countries. But this Molnupiravir, which Shashank has already mentioned, that the Western world has used. In fact, UK was the first one, UK, USA, so many European countries. Now, to add, it has got even approval in New Zealand and Australia also. So we have got so many countries which has got the strongest approval bodies authorizations has approved this drug for the use in COVID-19 and we ourselves, all of us have used it and we have seen excellent results without any side effect. So probably we really need to justify, you know, why this social media are talking so about it. So let's come to the questions. There is a question from Dr. Shailendra. Uh, does this drug has safety concern as hyped in India, uh, hyped in media? And uh, any other side effects? Of course, Shashank has already mentioned few side effects. Shashank, you want to elaborate on it? Any other things? Uh, let's talk, I mean, mention about the what media is hyped about the uh, mutagenicity and teratogenicity. So clearly, let us look at where we can't use the drug. Yeah. Don't use it below 18. Don't use it too late. Don't use it beyond five days. Currently, pre and post exposure is not recommended. Don't use it in pregnancy and people with childbearing potential, male and female one, both. Okay, so that is something which we need to recognize, but that data also will be available. I, I am not at all worried about that mutagenic and teratogenic concern. That is completely out, out founded, and it is some overzealous enthusiasm. 
it can be very beautifully used in geriatric population population pharmacokinetic analysis has shown age gender race and ethnicity do not have any influence on the pharmacokinetics of molnupiravir it can be given to people with renal and hepatic and impairment also so these are some of the positives which you need to highlight on the drug and is something which we can do but do not think that this can prevent covid or is a substitute for a vaccine and is unsafe agent it's a very very safe agent with excellent and good data in the us unfortunately they had another molecule which is written up here based molecule from pfizer which had a little more compelling data compared to molnupiravir therefore the hype and enthusiasm there was a little less in its use but if it is not available it is still used also remember it doesn't interfere with immunity at all including vaccine immunity i can see dr usha has asked that question it is a very safe drug for a virus you need to kill the virus if you hit hard hit early you should kill the virus it's a very specific antiviral agent it is best works in the first 24 hours 48 hours or 72 hours so uh, shashank uh, suppose somebody has a symptom onset till how many days you would recommend to use it if it is indicated in that particular patient because you know there were a lot of issues earlier people started using antiviral on day 8 day 7 day 10 so would you consider the better between third to seventh day you can use it earlier the better better the response yeah so that is the very important message that it has a utility when used in viremic phase and that is the time when it has a maximum effect over there. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Monil. Uh, what is the way forward for molnupiravir when COVID is declining? I mean, that's what they, probably they want to know. What is the future of molnupiravir? Are you looking at it? So any RNA-based so, virus, including flu virus, influenza, and newer variants of COVID, there is a role for it in symptomatic viral disease. Correct. Uh, when uh, I remember, Shashank, when we had this H1N1, which came in a big way, we used to prescribe Oseltamivir, which was triple prescription and all that we're using, it was in short supply. And today, when we are seeing it is one of the prescribed drugs. So I'm sure this would be one of the therapy which is going to remain because COVID is not going to go away. And uh, that is where when even if it goes from pandemic or even when it becomes endemic, still there would be role of the therapy which we will be look forward it. Okay, uh, the question is of course why ICMR is not recommended. Shashank has already answered that the best known to them, but uh, yes, it is BCGI approved drug. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Sunil: Why Omicron is a mild variant compared to Delta variant? <laughs> so evolutionary biology wise, it is more contagious but less virulent. This is how viruses evolve. If you saw and studied 100 years back, the Spanish flu also, over two years, the flu virus became less virulent, less fatal, more contagious. So that is how it is. Yeah. It's so an evolutionary is, biological phenomenon. Correct. So, and that pattern we have seen very classically, you know, over a period of time, that the maximum virulence which we have shown is the definitely during the last wave but at the same time, the severity of the disease manifestations was less. So it was more of infectivity and less of the severity, which is there. Uh, okay, there is a question that by, why 800 milligram capsule is not available when you have to take 800 milligram? Obviously, I think it is the company can answer that and probably once they get the approval. Uh, I, I think I will invite Dr. Snehal. Uh, would you like to answer that? Uh, why 800 milligram strength is not available and i remember with favipiravir also initially we started with the 200 milligram and then we had of course the strength which are available up to 800 milligram so uh, snehal would you like to answer that yeah uh, so uh, dr ketan in the same way even for monopiravir works i'm progress so the day we are able to get that 800 milligrams yes we will be coming out but at, as of now yes it's 200 but same way as Fabipidavir, we are also trying to get it into a higher strength. So it may take some okay. time, but it will surely come. Okay. Uh, there is a question by Dr. Ami. Molnupiravir is indicated in high-risk patients, but can it be given to young patients 
who do not have any comorbidity. So uh, again, again, I'm sure Shashank will answer that, but the point is whether are we looking at Omicron variant versus uh, non-Omicron variant? So uh, you need to take a call on that. So your question is that, can it be given to young patients? So it, it is always can be given, but whether it is required to be given, that is another thing. And Shashank will answer that. So 55-year-old symptomatic patient with fever of 103 for two days, I would give. But if the same person has no comorbidities, asymptomatic completely, diagnosed by accident, I think I will use clinical discretion and just wait. So it is on the clinical picture. So every patient is different. For the same age, for the same patient with symptoms and manifestations, you should give. So you have to use clinical discretion there. Absolutely. A question from Dr. Hardik. Is it safe in diabetes? Shashank has already said yes, it, it is safe. safe. In we have data in diabetes. We will publish it soon. Yeah. Uh, so uh, absolutely, that has been given. Uh, the questions which are covered. Now, I would ask another important question is, we have seen the uh, cocktail antibody which were used during the second, after the second wave, and then also, and it was still continued to use during the third wave. Uh, what would this be combined with monoclonal antibody cocktails? Uh, you can combine it. There is no, nothing against not to combine it. Okay. So it is not that you can't use it, but the overall cocktail antibody uh, um, uh, prevalence came down because of Omicron. Correct. Because the uh, obviously the efficacy which was not been established, rather in fact it has shown no beneficial effect in the Omicron variant and that's how it was not used. Only in the Delta variant it had shown a significant benefit over there. So with now the freely availability of Molnupiravir, you think there is uh, uh, any place where favipiravir still can be used or would you prefer using in most, wherever you want to use antiviral, you would prefer molnupiravir? No, I think one is virostatic, one is virocidal. So my preference and data is much more with uh, molnupiravir compared to favipiravir. Correct. So, so my current data based on sheer data and evidence base will be molnupiravir. Okay. So that's, that is the thing. And secondly, I, I'm sure all of us have seen the issue with terms of high dosage. You know, the loading dose, I, I remember that time also, nine tablets in the morning, nine in the evening, 18 tablets on day one, when they are already having a lot of other symptomatic treatment. And that was a very major compliance hurdle, which all of us have feel when we have started using the favipiravir, which is uh, obviously a major thing which is taken care of. Because now with uh, molnupiravir, it is a 200 milligram. And now soon, I'm quite hopeful that it would be available as 800 milligram. So it will be very easy to use also. Uh, uh, Shashank, uh, it, uh, in Uttar Pradesh they, state, they have uh, done some uh, survey and they have found that you know for healthcare workers, even if it is mild without any comorbidities, you know they started using it just to reduce their the, the disease duration and for them to come back early to work. Would you think that has a role or impact, you know, to reduce the disease duration? That is reasonable. We, one, we have used it in India. So that would be another thing where, of course, uh, it is uh, used here. But uh, there is, I think, one last question which came that uh, if COVID patient, I mean, if COVID patient test positive after five days of molnupiravir therapy, what should be the plan of action? So my question would remain why, why he was checked and day five for again for RT-PCR or a test. But there is shared virus on shedding also. Absolutely. And there is nothing to get panicky. A lot of people will shed virus even after a therapy. But they shed, see the RT-PCR test checks live and dead virus both. So it may be shedding a dead virus. So there's nothing to panic about it. Yes, that is the very thing. And friends, as Shashank has already said that we are coming towards, we are quite hopeful that coming towards the end of the pandemic. And if you read yesterday's news, you know, it was, I was really surprised to see the UK is the first country who have declared that even an RT-PCR test positive person need not quarantine or isolate themselves mandatorily. If by choice they want to do, they can do it. And this was the news which has come up just yesterday from the 
health ministry from UK, and that was very shocking. So probably a time has come when we need to start accepting that this is a part of it and we need to live with it. How we did with H1N1, when it came, we all were so much scared and staying away from it, and now it has become a part of it. So I think we had a fantastic discussion with Professor Dr. Shashank Joshi, and he really had thrown a very important points related to COVID-19 and the monopiravir therapy, which can be wisely used. So with this word, I would thank Shashank for his elaborate presentation and clearing most of the doubts which the people had it. And with these words, before I hand over back to Snehal, uh, uh, Shashank, final word of message, would you like to give it to our delegates? No, keep it simple, hit hard, hit early. If somebody is symptomatic, don't wait. Uh, we still have long COVID to go. This is a life-saving drug. Use it when symptomatic. Fantastic. I, I remember Shashank's word when the COVID started and he still uses his word. This disease, don't take it lightly. It's predictably unpredictable. And that's what a punchline from Shashank, which he missed it. So I said, yes, that is Shashank's punchline. So thank you so much, Shashank. And with this word, I will hand over to Snail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shashank and Dr. Keith Mehta for this excellent uh, shot. So thank you very much. And especially for removing the time from your busy schedule and uh, being a part of this webinar. I would also like to thank all our delegates who have logged in with us. And at the same time, a big thank you to IGCP team for conducting this webinar. So, so let's all stay safe, stay healthy till we meet next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.